everybody. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Lucy Bologna and I am the spokesperson for the Cancer Association of South Africa. Um, we are very excited to be actually addressing a unique topic, um, an audience that is often not looked at. We're talking about adolescents and young adults diagnosed with cancer. Um, on our panel today, we have Dr. Marius Virga. He will be sharing his valuable information. I'll be introducing him a little bit in a, in a little while. We also have Mariska Schulz. She actually is a childhood cancer survivor and today a qualified dietitian. And then we also have with us a Nina Mehring. She manages our childhood cancer services at the Cancer Association. Um, also with us, we have got um, Marius. And Emmanuel, they're part of what we call the EP Digital team. They manage all of our tech and um, all of the tech aspects are now and, and the back end is what we call. So we're going to get straight into it. And I'd like to ask you all welcome to drop any comments or if you've got any questions, please make use of the chat box. We'll be monitoring it and we're hoping that after um, Dr. Morris Vitka has done his talk and after Mariska has shared, um, you can definitely, we'll try and address some of the questions. And if we don't, we've definitely got an email that you can send us information to. So I'm going to ask Anina, you're our um, part of our childhood cancer team at Cancer. Um, I'm just going to hand over to you to say a few words. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Lucy. Um, when we looked at various studies and the programs already developed globally, it became clear to us that adolescents and young adults are a very unique group of people with specific needs when diagnosed with cancer. It became important that cancer address this uniqueness within South Africa. Cancer TLC is proud to announce that we will soon launch the Free to Be Me Cancer Program for adolescents and young adults. This online program will support and educate the adolescent and the young adult to understand, adjust, and ease the emotional burden of living and coping with a cancer diagnosis. This age-appropriate program will support them on all levels with a variety of subjects and interventions to allow them to process their journey on their own terms creating resilience where they need it most. This will be an important platform for this unique group of people where they feel understood when they're dealing with uncertainties, demands and responsibilities within a life-threatening illness. Uh, we are especially thankful uh, for Dr. Virga with his Peter Arts program and his contribution towards the Free to Be Me. I would also like to thank Professor van Grenen and her team from the Center for Community Technology at the University of Nelson Mandela. Um, thank you for all your hard work and your help with the development of this program, as well as Dr. Annemarie Oberlozer and Dr. Milani Pistorius for their support and valuable input towards this. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Anina. So as you can see, there have been quite a few number of role players in the background getting this ready. Um, but let's hear from our, our guest this evening. So Dr. Maurice Virga, he's a, a psychiatrist, a, a psycho-oncologist, a cognitive behavioral therapist, a supervisor, and a trainer. He serves as the medical director of psychosocial oncology at Memorial Care Todd's Cancer Institute and chair of psychiatry departments at Long Beach Memorial Medical Center, and he also served as the medical director of the Simonton Cancer Center in Malibu, California. Obviously, this is all in America. However, he has been working very closely with our team here in South Africa, and um, he's, he's founded the program Beat the Odds, and um, we're actually going to be keen to hear what you have to say, so let's get straight into it. Good morning. Here is morning. Good evening for uh, for you. So uh, it is such a pleasure for being invited and uh, honor. Thank you very much. So actually, in right now in in our uh, Cancer Institute in California, we are 
adapting beat the odds to the needs of adolescents and young adults. Um, so what I will be talking about is really general information that applies to both uh, adolescent and young adults, but as well as adults, because there's much more research in psychosocial oncology, particularly the survival outcome research uh, with adults. So I will use that research, but it also applies to uh, the uh, adult populations, um, particularly of 14 years of age and older. So let me share my screen. Uh, and yes, please uh, send questions uh, in the chat box. I would be happy to answer them at the end. Uh, so that is my, uh, um, my goal. So to really address your needs. Uh, so, a, as Lucy already mentioned, that I was the medical director of Simon Thun Cancer Center uh, for many years. Because of what? The Beat the Odds program is based on the work of famous uh, oncologist, Dr. Uh, Carl Simonton, uh, who was radiation oncologist and who developed this program for supporting emotional health and psychological health for cancer patients already in 1971. And, a, and already in 1973, he started demanding that his patients will bring a primary support person with them. And that applies to, uh, to also uh, adolescent young adults, that we cannot do any interventions in uh, in absence of really primarily support the people, usually the parents that would be, or legal guardians uh, for young people or, or their friends too. So, so that's important. And so I had the privilege of working for many years uh, with Dr. Simonton closely and be the odds is based on his work. So it's inspired by him. So the central uh, aspect of it because Dr. Maltzby started uh, his program because he noticed that uh, patients did not participate in a uh, promising radiation oncology trial and that was supposed to increase efficacy of treatment but decrease side effects. So he thought it was a slam dunk that everybody would like to participate in. But it turned out that patients did not. And he when he checked why, they were hopeless. So addressing hopefulness was uh, really central uh, to his program. And, um, and here he is, uh, in 2005, uh, he joined our Beat Dots program. And actually, whenever he was in town, uh, we just live on the other sides of Los Angeles. So he was on the north side, I was, I'm in the south side. So he has, sometimes would come and lead uh, one of the classes for us. So when the person is diagnosed with cancer, the first question very often is, how long will I live? And yes, and physicians may often give you the statistics and so on, but remember, uh, these statistics apply to populations, not individuals. So really it does not give the answer, but this is a quite a nagging question. Um, uh, even statistics, if they give statistics, there's, they're often misunderstood. But I will not be talking about statistics today, even though it is a fascinating subject. I'm going to be talking about what actually Dr. Simon then discovered. Okay, so, so he discovered, so in 1980, he co published his um, results comparing results of his patients. And he was only looking at patients with a metastatic disease. So stage four disease. And he was comparing them to the best uh, cancer centers in the United States. And it turned out that his, uh, that from that comparison, his patients lived much longer, had better quality of life. And those who died had better quality of death. And it was, he named it, it was preliminary study. Um, and the, it, of course it was designed uh, not to be a randomized clinical trial, so it was criticized, uh, but you see, since then, there were uh, five randomized clinical trials uh, that confirmed the effectiveness of 
psychosocial interventions on actually improving the survival rate. And it is not just length of survival, but also increase the number of long-term survivors, meaning people who at the end of the study didn't have any evidence of disease or no evidence of progression of the disease. So I'm not going to be going through each of those studies, but just wanted to, and they primarily involve women with uh, breast cancer, also malignant melanoma, GI uh, cancers. But the last uh, study by, done by Barbara Anderson is really interesting because it was possibly the best designed study. And uh, we will not go into details of this trial, but what they noticed is that um, they wanted to uh, do the psychotherapeutic intervention uh, group. It is a group, just in groups, uh, as early as possible after diagnosis. And what they noticed is that when they, these were women with stage one to stage three breast cancers. And a, here we see the dotted line is those who were treated only conventionally. Uh, and the solid line is those who were, in addition to conventional treatment, received uh, psychotherapeutic interventions. And we see that there is recurrence free survival is much longer. Uh, breast cancer specific survival is also improved. But you see, those women were also dying less from other causes too. So that is a, so it is, so the psychotherapeutic interventions were protective in multiple domains. Not only that, they did another study, uh, they reanalyzed and looked only at women who eventually had uh, developed metastatic disease. And uh, and even in the, that, and you see, this study was probably this study was published in 2010, but the research itself took place in early 1990s. So it takes so much time to look at that, and very often this 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 women this these women with had recurrence uh, uh, six, seven, ten years later. So. Uh, and still the effect of those interventions that they received many years earlier had a, a beneficial effect on their survival. And what they noticed that their uh, psychological distress, yes, when they learned that they had recurrence, it was high, but it dropped uh, quickly when they were able to apply their skills that they learned a um, uh, long time ago. Also to start with the social support, and this is very critical, because all good psychosocial interventions teach patients how to expand uh, their social uh, support by, effect by uh, effective uh, social support. And here is natural uh, killer cell cytotoxicity because we have two specialized uh, types of uh, cells that protect us from cancer, uh, which is uh, um, uh, natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells. And, and here they tested the activity and we see that, the, and in another study it was also shown that natural killer cells activity as well as cytotoxic T cell activity goes up uh, with these interventions. Uh, so, and, um, so this is the fifth uh, study that was published in um, 2015. And in 2021, there was a study, it is not a survival study, but effectiveness of the Simonton program that was, um, this study comes from Iran, and I was pleasantly surprised to have uh, also studies uh, uh, using Simonton method. Uh, so this nagging question, how long will I live, you see, is a reflection of, yes, we want to, uh, uh, to live as long as possible, but this nagging question is very similar to a question that a child, if any of you has ever been in a longer road trip uh, with a, a, um, a child or ad adolescent. Uh, so you, particularly with children, you may hear, um, are we there yet? That is a common, when are we going to get there, right? So, so our thinking is, uh, so that, that, that road trip is not very pleasant when you have a passenger who is always asking about that. And it is the same nagging question, how long will I live? 
is very similar. So if, if we are not there yet, where are we? We are here now, right? So that is a very important thing. If we are not there yet, we are here now. So instead of asking ourselves a question that has no answer, uh, how long will I live? It is much more important to ask ourselves a question, how will I live? And that, that is something that I can influence right now, right away. And actually in our uh, program and beat the odds, in the first class that we teach, we teach 10 skills of uh, cancer survival so that people can apply them right away, immediately. And uh, uh, so because of what? We know if something is effective on us and improves our quality of life, we feel it right away if it is effective or not. So we know the, from different studies that a cancer progression is increased when there is lack of social support, there is depression, there is distress and trauma history. Adverse childhood events, unfortunately, uh, have significant role here too. But these are not irreversible because we know that stress is an important part of it. And actually the uh, physiology of stress was first uh, uh, discovered by Hans Selye. He was a, um, a Hungarian uh, physiologist uh, who said that our best way of dealing with stress would be uh, really to correct and complement the body's own autopharmacologic efforts to combat the disease. So that is what we are doing and uh, we are going to talk about, about it now. Because you see, uh, when Lucy introduced me, she said that I'm cognitive behavior therapist and also therapy uh, in supervisor and trainer. What is cognitive behavioral? You see, we cannot change our emotions other than by changing how we think and how we act, right? So for example, when someone has cancer, we cannot get rid of that cancer right away um, or sometimes at all. So if the person is upset, anxious and depressed because of, and stressed out because of cancer. So the only way they can decrease it is by thinking differently about that cancer and its treatment. Uh, so that is, the, that is happening in prefrontal cortex. That is the thinking part of the brain. And our thoughts influence how we feel. So that is, um, and behavior of course is behavior. So cogn cognitive is, is, is our thinking part. Cognitions are our thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes, how they uh, affect our emotions. And in green here, you have the, the emotional part of the brain. Um, and what happens is this emotional part of the brain is also responsible for um, managing our hormonal system, uh, our autonomic nervous system, the automatic things that happen in our bodies, you know, like digestion and, and bowel movements and heart rate and blood pressure and all this natural, and also breathing. But also we think of, a bra of the brain as being just the multiple connections of electric wires, right? But in fact, a brain is the most complex uh, gland in our bodies. It, we have identified over 80 different substances that are released by the brain. And these substances, among them are neuropeptides, uh, it's, it's have effect on our body and uh, and um, Candice Perth, who discovered the first uh, neuropeptide, which was an uh, endorphin, which is internal morphine. It is a painkiller that is released by our brain. Um, she said that uh, these are molecules of emotions because with each emotion, we release a specific cocktail of those neuropeptides that have specific effect on our body. And here we know that both hormonal system, autonomic nervous system, and as well as the uh, neuropeptides and other chemicals that are released by our brain has effect on our immune system. So on the bone marrow, when the um, immune cells are produced, on uh, spleen, uh, thymus, and lymph nodes where the um, 
uh, immune cells are maturing, and then particularly, particularly the uh, cytotoxic T cells, the T is from thymus, um, uh, as well as natural killer cells. And, and they have also effect on their activity in the periphery. That is how our interventions may have effect on those cells. But not only that, our brain receives information through the released cytokines on the state of our immune system. So it is a two-way street like, of communication. And we know that it affects not just uh, that, but also the tumor microenvironment. Uh, the immune system in, in there is affecting how um, our bodies can fight cancer. Uh, not only that, these interventions that we have, they affect us on a gene level. And we know um, that uh, the, the telomeres um, repair themselves much more effectively uh, with, uh, for example, laughter. Laughter is a very common emotion and it has been uh, a, a done a lot of studies were done on on the value physiological value of laughter also in cancer, but it is subject for maybe a different uh, talk. And but we know that our our thoughts through our emotions affect us also on the gene on the molecular level. So cognitive behavioral therapy is actually a biological therapy because it changes the structure and chemistry of our brains and makes our brains more resistant to anxiety and depression. And, and there are a lot of positive effects of, of uh, psychology and that can be tested uh, in our physiology. Um, but if you would like to see natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells in action, you can go to this website, um, and under videos, there are some videos of actual cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells eliminating cancer cells. So, uh, and there are also some other, you will see that uh, common granulocytes can also kill cancer that we didn't think that was possible. So the aspect of how will I live, that is an important part. And you see, I said that our thoughts influence our emotions. That is not a new idea to talk cognitive behavior therapy, but cognitive behavior therapy, uh, really its principles were discovered uh, over 2,500 years ago. And um, the father of medicine, Hippocrates, used to say that every person should know that from the mind and from the mind only arise our pleasures, joys, as well as our sorrows, pains, grief, suffering, and tears. All these and other emotions come from the mind and only from it. So that is very important that we have uh, effective ways of, effective, of influencing um, our thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes uh, through cognitive behavior therapy and, and this way on our emotions and then having that effect on our uh, physiology. And that is a very important because, as I said, for Simon, addressing hopefulness was a really key issue. Uh, and, uh, and you see hope is defined as a belief that what is desired is also possible. So because Simon had such great effects uh, and he was invited by different medical schools to present, uh, he was often accused that he's giving people false hope. The funny thing is that in medical schools, as well as nursing schools and psychology uh, schools, we are never taught um, what hope is, but we are always warned not to give patients false hope. Uh, and we are also warned that, oh, disappointed patient is not good for your practice. So we, as physicians, we tend to paint the worst case scenarios. Um, so they were accusing Simonton that he's giving people false hope. So he would simply ask, okay, before we talk what is false hope, let me ask you, do you know what is hope? And they usually wouldn't know. But the first definition, the library edition of Webster Dictionary says that hope is a belief, right? Uh, that what is desired is also possible. 
So that means there's always space for hope. That the definition of hope already has that non-attachment to the outcome. Like we may say, when will I live? Uh, how long will I live? Or when are we going to get there? Um, it is attachment to the outcome. I want to be somewhere else that I am. While, uh, so translating into health and illness, I, I have to get well, or I, uh, I should get well, or um, these are ex examples of attachment to the outcome. Um, uh, I don't want to go to the details of that, but it is more. Um, uh, but there's always space of, for hope, and I'm going to explain. People think of hope as quite rigid, but in fact, it is very dynamic. It changes under life circumstances change, and hope is specific. We may have different hopes for different things. Um, for example, uh, I may have hope. I may hope that I'm going to <laughs> complete this 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 thing in a lot of time and have time to connect with you and. Since I don't see your faces, I don't even know if I, you are listening, <laughs> but I'm hoping for that, right? And at the same time, uh, so there may be, there may be multiple uh, hopes. And, um, and the, exactly, uh, and, uh, so, and also hope is not exclusive. One hope does not exclude another one, and that is the wisdom of hope. And for example, when I am diagnosed with uh, cancer, I may hope that this cancer is curable, and the treatment is going to be quick, and I can get on my with my life and and, be, uh, and enjoy my life. But at the same time, I may hope that if it is not curable, uh, the treatment may be effective to keep this cancer at bay, and I may have long life. And very often, cancer is now considered a chronic disease when it is um, in advanced stage. Um, but also at the same time, I may have hoped that if it is not curable and it cannot be kept at bay, and that if I am going to die soon, I may hope that I'm going to die a relatively free of pain, uh, comfortable, with peace of mind, and surrounded by people who love me and who I also love because, you know, um, uh, that I want to enjoy them too. Um, so, so hope is, uh, is not a rigid thing. And you see people, uh, and we can have space for hope in, the, in always. And here is the quote from Viktor Frankl, who is a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and he, he noticed that people who were surviving uh, in, in uh, uh, concentration camps were not always the strongest, the smartest, but these were people who could exercise the last of human freedoms is the ability to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances. That means that, that we can shift how we think in even in extreme situations. Um, so, so what is Beat the Odds? Beat the Odds is a, a multi-model, uh, meaning we use multi, many modalities in our treatment, mind, body, cancer survivorship program. Uh, for patients and their families. So we want the family members or the primary support people to join us because we want to teach all of them their skill, the skills, the same skills of emotional uh, health. And uh, also we, we have uh, classes on support and communication and improving communication, decreasing stress and so on. So these are classes and we call them not a support group, but it is more a skills training program. Um, of course, we provide support too, uh, but we want to distinguish ourselves from, from non-structured uh, uh, open uh, uh, support groups. So and we employ you know, cognitive, behavioral, emotional, social, physical, as well as spiritual um, spheres. We address those spheres and it is culture free and has been used in different uh, countries from the United States to, I, I had the privilege of uh, conducting a retreat also in South Africa um, when I met uh, Anina actually, and also in Japan and, and uh, many European countries. So, so it is um, culture free. Um, so, and the principle that, Principles of of these uh, of this program are really were formulated by Carl Simonton, and 
And Carl used to start uh, the sessions by saying the purpose of this work is to improve the quality of life today, to bring more joy and reduce stress, suffering, and pain. So that was very specific and, and very important. Each class was supposed to improve my quality of life right now. So each class uh, gives more and more skills of, <clears throat> <excuse me. clears throat> of improving my life. So, and unlike some traditional uh, therapies, uh, we are not analyzing people what's wrong with them. We are focusing on what's right with people and building on that. And, and if there's anything that needs to be addressed, it's going to reveal itself in our life right now. Um, so we don't need to dig in the past. Of course, what happened in the past is important, but at the same time, uh, we can address it in the current uh, moment, in the present time. Uh, also very important that we all have limitations, uh, physical, emotional, intellectual, or spiritual, and it is very important that we honor those limitations. Uh, also honoring the fact that even though we are teaching many, uh, it is multimodal, like in cancer treatment is, is multimodal. We, we know that we have uh, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, surgery, immunotherapy, hormonal therapy, and those things were synergistically. That means that if applied together, the effect is greater than it would be just the sum of the effects of each treatment. The same thing here, we use mo many modalities and they work synergistically. So, and, and, and the program is very cohesive. So what we say at the beginning is consistent throughout the program and also at the end. Um, and, but this, the, how the people are going to use those modalities is different from person to person and what effects they are going to, to have. Um, the concept of being uh, balancing caring with non-attachment to the outcome. So we know that attachment, I have to get well, um, I should get well is creating stress. Some people get detached and they come across as they don't care. We find a, a balance. I want to be caring and engaged and involved and committed, but at the same time non-attached. Um, so it is important to support healthy hope. And and very important thing, if there is any improvement of our intervention on survival, it is a byproduct of improved quality of life. It is not our goal, right? So, because we don't know uh, if, oh, if I'm doing this is improving my survival rate. No, we don't know that. But what we do know, if my quality of life is improving um, and I can feel it if I have more joy at the present moment. And also uh, in our program we, for the alumni of Beat the Odds, we have Boost the Odds. It is from cancer survivor to life thriver, and it is evidence-based medicine-driven um, program of lifestyle modification, it, um, also for cancer survivors and their families, because we want every, the milieu in which the patient lives is also changing. So this very much applies also to uh, uh, adolescent young adults, because developing healthy habits in life are really uh, important. But at the same time, if you are talking about healthy lifestyle, so you always think about deprivation and the, 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 we are not very enthusiastic about it. Most of us do know what we need to do to have a healthy lifestyle, but we don't do it because it is hmm, for many reasons. So the way we are approaching it, we are trying to help people establish healthy lifestyle without deprivation, stress, or a sense of failure, because um, that is what sometimes people fear. And it is in the areas of nutrition, physical activity, social support, support sleep and rest, laughter and play. Um, Simon used to say that laughter and play are not electives, they are mandatory. And also we added connection with nature, actually through the inspirations that we had in South Africa and creative expression. Mm. And when we talk about mind-body connection, we know our mind says, get up, but body says, no. Um, and, and also we are now developing, uh, actually we developed, uh, the beat the odds in an application that is right now only for women. Uh, and we right now are doing a clinical trial in our, our center for effectiveness. 
uh, of this intervention. These are 22 classes, a 15 minute uh, each um, that patients have in their pockets and they can apply to themselves. Uh, we have we ran similar trials in Poland and uh, where I'm originally from, and in Germany. And we are gearing up to do uh, another research study um, uh, of the re rethink game. It is ba based on a form of cognitive behavioral therapy called rational emotive behavioral therapy, and it is with Babes Bolai University uh, in Romania, in Cluj, Napoca in Romania, and they developed this uh, game, uh, real game that teaches kids healthy. Um, hey, healthy thinking, um, um, and it is fun. Actually, I enjoyed it myself. So, so in general, so what I can do to to improve uh, my quality of life and uh, potentially be dealt, first of all, is reducing stress. We cannot avoid stress, but really being attentive and uh, particularly with chronic stress. If if we if something is missing in our lives or we are sad uh, often. We need to address that. Remember that our negative emotions are having are not bad. Our negative emotions are a signal for change. Uh, it is very important that all um, adolescents and young adults are screened for depression, um, because and if the depression is discovered, that this depression is treated and cognitive behavior therapy uh, delivered online is very yeah. effective. Uh, there are also, um, uh, there is expanding quality social support and improving communication in the family. These are very, very important things. We mentioned lifestyle modification, and I cannot emphasize more laughter. Laughter is such a, a wonderful uh, treatment. Um, and of course, as Carl Simonton used to conclude his speeches always, there is still a lot that we don't know but we can't let things that we don't know stop us from applying the things that we do know. I mentioned that most of these studies that I quoted are done with adults, but we do know that these things work and there are no reasons why they should not work with adolescents and young adults. So I would encourage you to uh, apply them uh, there too. So uh, I would be happy to address any questions, comments, uh, uh, and I'm hoping only because I don't have see any feedback that my microphone was not muted all the time. Uh, and I was just talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, you weren't. In fact, we do have, I see we have three questions. So what I'm going to suggest, I'd like Mariska, and thank you. That was actually quite interesting. I especially like what you said about laughter and about the hope you know, especially when, you know, we think of the impact on young, on adults, never mind young people. Um, I'm going to ask Mariska if you wouldn't mind going next, and then we'll come back to those questions. I'm just worried that they might take a bit of time, but thank you. We did. We actually received three very interesting questions. So I'm going to go straight through to Mariska and introduce you. She was actually diagnosed in her teens. Um, with um, a cancer and um, she's now an adult and um, she's going to be sharing her story quickly with us. Hello everyone. I hope you can all hear me loudly and nicely. <laughs> um, so I just want to say thank you for this opportunity to tell my story today. Um, I am Mariska, as Lucy has introduced me and I am 27 years old. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, so that's cancer of the lymph node, when I was 15 years old. And as any teenager would, I was uncertain about what this disease is. I could see by the tears in my parents' eyes that it wasn't anything good. At age 15, um, one has really heard about the big C word and never mind chemo and radiation therapy. So I began my journey as a very uncertain girl, surrounded by doctors, nurses, concerned family members and friends. I was often, often referred to as the girl with cancer, because how often really does a high school girl get cancer? <clears throat> Stares and concerned comments followed me everywhere, especially when my hair started falling out and effects of the chemo and the radiation therapy was visible to everyone. 
for me, losing my hair was one of the most, the hardest things I have ever had to endure. And as a teenager, some kids could really be mean. I remember one um, kid at the school once hugged me and he was like, oh no, I'll get cancer. And I was horrified. But the truth is teenagers don't really know how to deal with such a serious disease. And so my first year of cancer was, I had to say the, the hardest for me. Um, as everything was uncertain and new, and I lost a lot of friends as I was just in school for sometimes days and weeks at a time that I wasn't there. It was, <clears throat> it was a lonely year, but it was also a blessed year as many people around us reached out to my parents and to help them financially and emotionally. My journey continued for four years. I did the first round of chemo and radiation therapy and was in remission for a year. And then unfortunately, a scan picked up cancer again. I started chemo and radiation again, but this time in a more advanced setting, meaning stronger and different doses of treatment. This time, I didn't lose any of my hair and I was overjoyed at the fact. Um, I met some amazing people and young ones that were the same age as me and that was walking this journey with me. Um, and that helped me a lot. Unfortunately, I also lost two of my friends during this time. And my journey continued, sorry, <clears throat> my journey continued as after this intense period of chemo, um, where I was booked into the hospital for four days at a time while I received the um, treatment, I was not in remission yet. And then the next step came and I had to um, have a bone marrow transplant. I was concerned with a whole list of new things having children one day being one of them. But this time I was um, in my final year of high school and I was turning 18 years old. I've made wonderful friends by in during this um, time who supported me and encouraged me. And the teenagers also <laughs> grew up a bit and were more mature. And then I received the bone marrow transplant after a third round of chemo in Cape Town in the same hospital where I received a second round. But this time, unfortunately, I lost all of my hair. It was slow and steady at first, but one morning I got up and when I lifted the brush to my hair and I pulled it down, like the whole section of hair came out and I was broken. So we called one of our family friends and she came and she shaved off my hair because losing bits at a time was more traumatic than losing little bits every day. And then after the chemo sessions, I finally received the bone marrow transplant. I was in isolation and the people that wanted to see me had to wear special clothing. But I tried to keep up with schoolwork and could still write my matric in the exam at the end of the year. My mother, family and friends were by my side through everything. And I can honestly say that I was blessed with some of the best friends. After the bone marrow transplant, everything started to look better. Then it was finally time for university. I still had to go for my yearly scans and I still get scared every time I have to go. And I still do till this day, but life is a lot better. Sometimes my mother asks me about something that happened during those four years and I cannot remember it. It is amazing how our brains process trauma and helps us to be resilient but sometimes I do smell something or hear, hear a certain song and I'm right back where I previously was when I heard it or when I got that smell. For example, my mother doesn't wear the perfume she used to while I got chemo because my brain just made that connection between the chemotherapy and that um, significant smell. Something else that I realized a bit later is that I didn't really cry during those four years because every time I did cry, my mother would cry with me and I would try to stop that um, and be strong for her that she could stop crying. But now when I speak about what happened, I cry easily. We have to remember that cancer does not define us. It is merely something that happens to us. And we become strong, empathetic, emotionally intelligent adults that still struggle with everyday things. But we have overcome so much already that it doesn't really compare to the everyday things that we go through. We also have to remember that our parents, family and friends has also have some trauma from this experience because the fear for us and the outcome is mostly out of their hands. This experience is a part of who we are meant to be and, who we are, um, and becoming who we are meant to be. 
and we can choose how we want to live our life after cancer. We can choose to forget about it completely, or we can choose to embrace the lessons and, and help others. And we can change our minds. I know for me, I didn't want to speak about uh, my journey for a long time, but after a year or so, I changed my mind and I chose to embrace what happened to me. So having a program that Dr. Um, Marius actually talked about now would, in my years, would have helped so much because um, giving you the emotional um, pillars to actually address the stresses and the family um, and emotional aspects of the disease would have helped a lot. And I just want to complete or end this um, thought uh, with one phrase that I felt like um, we can help us through these hard times. And it is just to live one day at a time and don't fret too much about tomorrow, but get through today in good health. Yeah, have a lovely evening. Wow. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Thank you. I think, Mariska, thank you for sharing a very vulnerable part of your journey. Having to, you know, imagine being a teenager in the first place. Now, having been diagnosed with cancer, I think it's hard enough being an adult with cancer now as a teen. So I think that's such a, a unique perspective that she's given us, Morris. Um, and we, we kind of imagine what it would be like, but when you hear it from somebody, when a friend, when you hugged your friend, I, I can imagine that must have been quite hard and, and, and quite traumatic. And when you spoke about the smells, I've often spelt with, spoken to cancer survivors where that smell gives you a trigger um, of, of that, that time and that treatment. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we really appreciate it. And I'm so glad that we can now see how this program is going to help others. So um, I see we've got questions. Shall we get straight into them? Do we have time? Morris, would you be able to answer a couple quickly? Um, I see we've got, um, the first one was um, asking about survival. What, what about synovial sarcoma survival? I'm assuming rates or, um, or is that one you want to answer by email? Oh, uh, I cannot tell you what is, what are the survival rates of synovial sarcoma? Um, out of the top of my head, sorry, that is. Okay, we, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll do an email. So, um, okay. for the person that asked, we will we will take that one by email. And then we have um, uh, the other question, and I think the other two are quite similar. Was how do you motivate, or what do you say to a teenager that has a few months to live? Uh, thank you very much. Um, that is a very important question. Um, you, we the motivation is also a very tricky thing because very often in such a situation first of all it is hard to be a teenager if if you are honestly remembering your teenage years just it is tough and on top of that uh, dealing with cancer and how it affects your relationships with others and how important are relationships and everything so so there are many things that the cancer is affecting for such a young person in a vulnerable, very vulnerable period of time. And they don't have yet full, uh, full emotional maturity and so on. Uh, so not, not, they are not just learning how to develop skills to cope with life. And the life is overwhelming to most uh, teenagers, right? Healthy teenagers. And so the motivation aspects are here. The, the, I think that very important that there is a space for expressing emotions. Uh, because one of the things may be that the teenager may be so angry at the diagnosis that it ruins um, their lives that, that, that they may not want to, do, to have anything to do with it. And they may refuse treatment or, you know, and, you know, being rebellious is part of the age too. Uh, so that is um, one part of it. The, uh, the other thing is, is really listening because very often we want the person to do something uh, and act in a certain way or participate in treatments. But you see, there are really important parts of it because for example, uh, anger, as you said, may be a protest understandable. And if we, even we can, and, and also expresses certain values. Mm -hmm. And if we, we can express the, help the teenager to express these values in a healthier way. 
Hopelessness, for example, we are talking, I was talking about hope, but hopelessness is also expression that I care because people think, oh, he's hopeless, he doesn't care. No, we never get hopeless about things that we don't care about. We only get hopeless about things that we do care, right? So hopelessness is really expression of, oh yeah, I do care, but I don't know how to achieve it. Also, uh, in particular, when someone went through several lines of treatment, they may be disappointed multiple times. So hopelessness protects us from this disappointment, right? It, it gives this detachment, as you said. And so hopelessness is, is uh, and hopelessness also shows courage that I can look at my life also for those things that I fear. So, 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 we, we, so negative emotions are not our enemy. Negative emotions are expressing something that we can learn from. Apathy, for example, is very often seen in te teenagers who are going through treatment for cancer. Apathy is a silent protest. It is something when I cannot really, when I don't have the energy or, or circumstances don't allow me to, to protest openly then I may show that protest through apathy. So to so apathetic person, it is not that they don't care either. They're very similar to, to hopeless, that they simply are protesting something. So, so really the way of motivating starts with listening. And in fact, I'm, I, there's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy called TEAM. Uh, the, the TEAM is an acronym for testing, empathy, uh, agenda setting and methods that does not apply any methods of changing thinking until the resistance and motivational aspects are addressed. So, so yeah, so these are, uh, this is developed by the, the Professor uh, David Burns uh, from Stanford University. So, so yeah, motivational aspects are complex, but, but the only way to address them is by listening first. Thank you. I see there's an interesting comment and then one more question um, talking about many childhood and adolescent cancer survivors actually have a better, I'm assuming this is quality of life after treatment than their healthy peers since they experience personal growth through their cancer journey. Oh well, yes, so we know that there is a concept of uh, post-traumatic growth and um, and we hope that, in fact, programs like Beat the Odds can help facilitate that process. And, but we also know that if you look at populations, and, and actually in the United States, there was uh, uh, this pretty large study, which was called AYA HOPE. And AYA stands for Adolescent and Young Adults, and HOPE stands for Health Outcomes and Patient Experience. And from their uh, view, the, 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 the participants, the young uh, um, uh, participants, they, they were talking about how it affected their education, employment prospects. Um, the financial burden in the, in the United States is very severe. And actually in our center, we, are trying, we were trying to develop interventions, psychosocial interventions for adolescent and young adults. But for them, addressing their financial issues and insurance issues was the most important issue. Um, peer relationships and family support was uh, significantly affected. So, come on, the sexual functioning and intimacy uh, is, is huge. Mariska talked uh, about how she lost her hair, and, and we know how appearance is important for teenagers. And, and so, so these are uh, these are important things. And we know more and more about how to address them effectively. Uh, and yes, we hope for post-traumatic growth for those young people. And some of them are, as Mariska is an example of it, uh, courageous, wonderful, beautiful people now. So thank you. Absolutely. I, I saw, I checked goosebumps when she was sharing a story. I think our last question, and then we will wrap up, is um, what is your view on especially young adolescents with cancer who are still receiving treatment but being told they are in a battle fighting against cancer um, what are the psycho or psychological effects and maybe if the treatment is failing and cure is not possible anymore 
they may feel they are failing personally and letting their loved ones down. So an interesting, you know, we've had this come up before actually amongst adults, never mind with youngsters. Oh, yes, that is a, an important thing. Actually, I, I co-authored an article about hope and, and attachment to the outcome and non-attachment to the outcome um, a, a, some time ago. And here, the crucial issue is the, the family and parents and parents' values. Uh, you see, losing a child is possibly the, the you know, this is tragic. Um, and the perspective that you might lose the child is tragic. So among parents, the attachment to the outcome is really huge, right? Uh, my child has to survive. They should do everything to cure my child. And, and then it is the problem that the child may very often is not listened to, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I really think that with all the, uh, the young people that I worked in different things, they, they are smarter than we think and they know more. Uh, and, and really they are much more comfortable with death and dying than, uh, than we adults. And we can learn a lot from them. And, um, and so, uh, and, and again, I just semantics of battle or fight. I really don't, don't think that it applies. Some, some, some survivors tell me that they like those, uh, um, you know, uh, military uh, association, but for many others, healing is a more gentle process, uh, more of, of exploring what's going on with them and being in harmony with, with themselves and people around them and the universe. Uh, so, uh, so, and putting the child, and, and really, even though the child may not be of the legal age of being able to decide for themselves, important that they, to listen to them and what the child wants. Uh, and be very, and they, the child may tell us something that parents don't want to hear, and 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 for parents to listen to them at those times is crucial. At the same time, very often uh, uh, extremely difficult, possibly the most difficult conversations that we have. Um, a very insightful, you know, when you say about how. So teens are actually quite smart and how they deal with death and dying. I've often heard that from our cancer TLC team. It's often the parents and the loved ones around the person coping. Well, we're actually running out of time. However, I'm going to ask Anina, would you do the closing words for us, please? Thank you, Lucy. I really just want to say I am so privileged to know uh, Marius and Mariska. Um, really, thank you so much. It was wonderful. And Mariska, you gave me goosebumps once again. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we are really very excited about pioneering this program. And we are very grateful to our international partners and our local partners um, that is already on board, um, Marius. We really appreciate you so much. Um, thank you for all your input and your assistance um, in this program. And I would like to end to say, if there's any person or organization that would like to get involved, you are very welcome to contact me. And I'm wishing you a very good evening and a good day to you, Marius, far away in California. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to join you and contribute a little bit that I could. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll have a recording of the session on our cancer website and YouTube. So just please follow our channels and um, we'll, where you'll be informed once it's up and running. Have a good evening and have a good day, Dr. Marius. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.